today's popular mythology, the 1950s are looked on as happy days, a time of fond nostalgia. For those charged with our nation's defenses, though, nothing could have been further from the truth. The chill of the Cold War had reached an icy low. There was a massive arms buildup in the Eastern Bloc, and our traditional information gathering methods were being cut off by a tightly drawn iron curtain. Adding to the temper of the times was a requirement to overfly certain areas of the world and ascertain the character and strength of their military development. In early December of 1954, operating under an approval granted by President Dwight Eisenhower, the task of creating such a craft was assigned to premier designer Kelly Johnson and his team from Lockheed's Advanced Development Projects Division, more popularly known as the Skunk Works. From the start, the new aircraft, simply called the U-2, was up against the wall. Since computers were still in their infancy, they would be of little help. The fledgling bird would mostly come together as an amalgam of slide rule technology mixed with experience and foresight. Even more critical, though, was the time factor. Johnson had promised to go from paper to prototype in just eight months, a schedule that would turn even the most ardent optimist pale. Yet laboring around the clock under a cloak of secrecy and a philosophy which simply stated, give a man a job, don't tell him how to do it, then give him the authority and encouragement to do it right, a small group of people began to turn the near impossible into reality. On August 6, 1955, the date of the U-2's first flight, there were no brass bands, press conferences, or reporters present. Just a small group of weary, dedicated men to witness an event that would forever change the course of strategic reconnaissance and have a profound effect on world history. With Johnson double-checking every minute detail, the first aircraft was completed on schedule. Almost from the moment of liftoff, it exceeded expectations and specifications. Because nothing in the U.S. flying arsenal in the 1950s could safely fulfill the mission requirements, the U-2 had to be different. And it was. With its long 80-foot glider-like wings and gently tapering 49-foot fuselage, the design represented a radical departure from anything in the sky at the time. Following in less than a year, the U-2 took off on its first operational mission. Although the details remain classified, it was later described as brilliantly successful. More operations soon followed, with similar results. Until a fateful May 1st day in 1960. It brought a young pilot, Francis Gary Powers, to world prominence. Later, after his retention in Russia, Powers joined Lockheed as a test pilot under the auspices of Kelly Johnson. Yet, so proficient had the U-2 proven to be as an all-weather, day-or-night reconnaissance aircraft that more were ordered into production in a variety of models to fit specific mission objectives, including one 
that played a prominent role in helping thwart the Cuban Missile Crisis. Standing in tribute to the versatility of its original design, the U-2 also proved to be quite adaptable, as it displayed when it successfully completed a series of sea trials as a potential carrier aircraft. Concurrent with its military role, the U-2 added to its reputation by becoming an instrument of science. Carrying the colors of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA U-2s soar high over the Earth, helping plot the course of urban development, recording the devastation of an erupting volcano, or the possibility of an early spring thaw. Its cameras can map huge swaths of landscape in a single pass with a scope and clarity unheard of just a few short years ago. Rising to altitudes above 70,000 feet, they chart the heavens, then descend, their high-performance sensors collecting millions of bits of information with each flight, data which is later meticulously studied by Lockheed and NASA scientists to help us better understand and manage the Earth's precious natural resources. Representing perhaps quiet testimony to its value as a national asset, 12 years after the U-2R line went out of production, a newer, more sophisticated version designated the TR-1 rolled out into public view in 1981. Equally significant to the event itself was the fact that this was the first time in Air Force history that an aircraft had been put back into production. Like their predecessors, the new tactical reconnaissance vehicles would become members of the United States Air Force's Strategic Air Command at Beale Air Force Base in California. The TR-1 would also continue the U-2's unparalleled 30-year heritage as the highest flying single-engine aircraft in the world. While still held in an enigmatic wrap of security, when the full story of the development and sustained operational use of the U-2 family is cleared, it will probably confirm what military scholars and chroniclers of world events have surmised but can't yet document, that the U-2's design, production, and service deployment are among the most spectacular achievements in aviation history.